On this episode of Twill, we've got a brand new kernel to talk about with Linux 6.8. GNOME has released the latest version of their desktop with GNOME 46, bringing a ton of desktop-related goodies. Fedora and OpenSUSE have released some betas for us to all try out and test. And Red Hat has announced a new driver project for NVIDIA support on Linux. All of this and more on this episode of This Week in Linux, your source for Linux good news. This episode of Twill is sponsored by Collide. More on them later. Linux 6.8 has been released, and while Linus Torvalds himself describes 6.8 as a fairly average release, there are plenty of reasons to be excited with the goodies that are going to be beneficial for everyone. So let's unpack the highlights. First of all, let's talk about some hardware stuff. So for gamers, the new AMD GPU driver boasts color management specifically for the ever-popular Steam Deck. And for Raspberry Pi 5 owners, you will be thrilled to know that the official kernel support for the Broadcom BCM2712 processor is there now, which is really good when you combine that with the, the Mesa drivers 23.3. It means that anything that has that and the latest kernel will have really out, great, solid, out-of-the-box support for the Raspberry Pi 5. And for those on the bleeding edge, there's even initial Rust support for the long arc architecture. Now, of course, security is a priority for the Linux kernel, and 6.8 does not fault here. It steps up its game by adding features like FScript support for CephFS. That is a difficult thing to say, CephFS. And host-side support for Intel's trust domain extensions. Much easier to say. Also, kernel 6.8 optimizes NUMA balancing and deadline scheduler for performance boosts, along with various other networking optimizations for smoother performance. There's also improved hardware support for a wide range of devices from laptops to gamepads and even the Nintendo Switch online controllers. And for those who like to tinker, there are a ton of interesting additions. The Z-Swap subsystem can now force data to swap under memory pressure, while a new mode lets you disable write back entirely. And developers will appreciate the new stat mount and list mount subsystem calls, along with the new deadline servers mechanisms. And also, let's talk about some RISC-V stuff, because I'm a big fan of RISC-V, and the RISC-V architecture gets some love in 6.8 with support for AMD's MicroBlaze V soft core CPU, and new features like the XIP kernel and the RISC-V HTB probe system calls. Now, of course, this came out recently, and there's also work already started on 6.9, and now there are, this is not necessarily going to be a big game changer with 6.8 for everyone, but for those who are using Ubuntu, the next LTS is coming with 6.8, so it's a big, it's an important kernel in that sense. And of course, the next version of, of the Linux kernel is supposed to be even bigger and better than this one, so I can't wait for that. And if you'd like to learn more about the latest release of Linux 6.8, you'll find links in the show notes. GNOME 46 is here, and it's packed with exciting new features, refinements, and bug fixes that will make your everyday computing experience smoother, more efficient, and dare I say, maybe even delightful. Whether you're a seasoned GNOME user or just dipping your toes into the Linux desktop world, then GNOME 46 has something to offer. So get ready to say goodbye to GNOME's old frustrating form of file hunting. GNOME 46 brings a supercharged search in the Nautilus file manager. The new search functionality allows you to search across all of your index locations with a single click. But if you need to narrow things down, you can still do that by using the search in folder option, which lets you focus on the directory you're currently browsing in. And on top of that, there's helpful alerts that are going to warn you when you're about to copy a behemoth of a file to a drive that can't handle it, saving you time and frustration, which is nice. Also, notifications have got a big update. They've gotten a much needed makeover in GNOME 46 because gone are the days of cryptic pop-ups. Now notifications boast clear headers that tell you which app sent them along with a handy icon for quick visual recognition. But if you need more information or want to take action on it, no problem, because expandable notifications will give you all the details and let you interact with them directly, which is pretty cool. This revamp paves the way for future features like notification grouping and making your notification center a much more useful tool. The settings app has undergone a big makeover, making it easier than ever to find what you're looking for and customize your system to your liking. A new system panel groups together essential settings like region and language, time and date, and more, keeping them neatly organized. Default app settings have been have a new home in the apps panel, where you can also configure options for removable media. 
Also, the GNOME online accounts, or GOA, is now more secure than ever because authorization for accounts happens through your default browser now, giving you complete transparency and the ability to use secure USB authentication methods. On the functionality front, a new web dev account type now lets you access online accounts like contacts, calendars, and files directly from your desktop applications. Plus, there's a new Microsoft personal account type that lets you tap into OneDrive storage within Nautilus. GNOME 46 is also enhancing their core apps this release. Calendar boasts improved performance and clearer month view. Maps benefits from a revamped Zoom control layout and a more user-friendly experience for managing your favorite places. And we also have some many, many more highlights. These are just a few of the things that I've mentioned, the tip of the iceberg, as you will. So GNOME 46 is brimming with additional goodies. Here's just a few. Remote login using RDP for accessing your desktop from afar. Uh, tap to click enable by default, which is very nice. H.264 software encoding for creating screen recordings with smaller file sizes. Improved fractional scaling support for crisper fonts and higher resolution displays. Uh, experimental variable refresh rate or VRR support for smoother visuals. And a plethora of bug fixes and performance improvements and all that sort of stuff. So that's awesome. GNOME 46 is here. So that means the wait is over, right? Not, not quite. Not quite. There is still a bit uh, left wait to wait. So, for example, Ubuntu 2404 LTS will have GNOME 4, uh, 46. Fedora 40 will also have GNOME 46. But both of those will be arriving in April. Though if you can't wait to give it a spin, you could try out Fedora 40 beta that just came out. And it just so happens that we're about to talk about that right now. The Fedora project has released the beta of Fedora Linux 40, offering a glimpse into what the final release is expected to be in April. This beta release provides an opportunity for users to test new features and report bugs, but keep in mind, it's not ready yet, so there will probably be bugs. And if you do wanna try it out, be sure to support, report those bugs if you find them, because that way the, the final version will be even better. Now, first things first, Fedora Workstation will be getting GNOME 46, like I said in the previous topic. For those who didn't watch the previous topic, go back and watch it because I'll talk about all the cool stuff that's in GNOME 46. And if, But if you don't want to wait, you can check out this spin for Fed the Fedora Workstation on Fedora 40 Beta. Now, Fedora 40 Beta also boasts a few key features for enthusiasts to tinker with. One of these features is PyTorch, a popular machine learning framework which can now be easily installed, which is very cool. However, this initial release only offers CPU support with GPU and NPU functionality planned for future updates. Fedora IoT Edition incorporates OS tree native containers, and while this is really cool for the Internet of Things use cases, users should be aware this is still under development. As we discussed on Twill 253, the Fedora project is retiring the branch names for their immutable desktop spins. Instead, they're reviving the Atomic desktop branding. So we now have spins like Fedora Sway Atomic and Fedora Budgie Atomic, though Fedora Silver Blue and Fedora Kinoite will remain, although they probably shouldn't because it's not really clear that Silver Blue is GNOME and Kinoite is KDE Plasma. I mean, Kinoite kind of makes more sense, you know, because Silver Blue doesn't even have a G in it. For, for GNOME or N. Moving on, the beta comes packed with updates for developers and enthusiasts. The KDE Plasma desktop receives a major overhaul with Plasma 6, and you can learn more about what's all in that and what's new with Plasma 6, specifically with Twill 255. Also, container management gets a boost with Podman 5, and developers will find the latest versions of LLVM 18 and GCC 14. And this, a comprehensive list of changes is available in the show notes links. But just a quick reminder, since this is a beta, users should be prepared to encounter bugs and missing features and, and that sort of stuff. Of course, you are encouraged to test the beta and report any issues encountered. And this feedback is crucial for improving the final release. And it doesn't benefit just Fedora users, but everyone, since Fedora is usually the distribution that pushes the envelope with innovative stuff. So... I would say check it out and let us know what you think in the comments. And also, uh, be sure to report any bugs you find if there are any. I've been using Fedora 40 KDE Plasma for a, quite a while, and I haven't really found any bugs necessarily. There are a few little quirks here and there, and I have reported them, but it's, it's interesting because the Fedora 40 KDE edition is Wayland only, and I was not aware of that until I started playing with it. 
And yeah, uh, for the most part, it's not a big deal. The Waylon works just just fine. We'll see about how that works with GNOME in the future because the GNOME 40 doesn't have that, but GNOME 41 is planned to do that. We talked about that in a previous episode as well. Uh, tangent over, I suppose. If you'd like to learn more about the latest news about the beta release of Fedora 40, you'll find links in the show notes. Let's talk about endpoint security. When you go through the airport, for example, there's a security line to check your ID and then another line to scan your bags. And the same thing happens in enterprise security, but instead of passengers and luggage, it's end users and their devices. And these days, most companies are pretty good at the first part of that equation where they check the user identity. But user devices can roll right through authentication without getting inspected at all in some cases. In fact, 47% of companies allow unmanaged, untrusted devices to access their data. That means an employee can log in from a laptop that has a firewall turned off and hasn't been updated in six months. Or worse, that laptop could belong to a bad actor using employee credentials. Collide solves this problem, this device trust problem. Collide ensures that no device can log into your Okta-protected apps unless it passes your security checks. Plus, you can use Collide on your devices without MDM, like your Linux fleet, contractor devices, and every BYOD or bring-your-own-device phone and laptop in your company. So visit thisweekinlinux.com slash collide to watch a demo and see how it works. That's thisweekinlinux.com slash K-O-L-I-D-E. We have a lot to talk about from the OpenSUSE project this week. And first, let's talk about Tumbleweed because OpenSUSE Tumbleweed now offers the ability to run GNOME 46 and KDE Plasma 6. So if you are waiting to run those, the wait is over for the rolling release Geekos. OpenSUSE also announced a beta release of their upcoming Leap 15.6. This beta offers a glimpse into the features of the next version, which is expected in mid-June. So here's a quick rundown of what to expect with Leap 15.6. It's built on top of SUSE Linux Enterprise 15 Service Pack 6. It is going to come with Linux kernel 6.4. They have updates to core components like glibc and systemd, which aims to enhance processing power and boot times. They also have some improvements to containers and virtualizations, so you can enjoy better container experience with Podman 4.8 and updated virtualization tools like Zen and KVM. Also, GNOME 45 is going to be included in this, which is actually a really big upgrade because Leap 15 came out many years ago and to continue to update the desktop to have GNOME 45, this is a big change. Even though it doesn't seem like it is because 46 just came out. This is a pretty big change, especially considering what Leap is meant to be, focusing on stability over uh, enhancements of software and that sort of stuff, which is really actually impressive because you know what you wouldn't expect that kind of thing. Also, they have some audio improvements with Pipewire 1.0.3 and Pulse Audio 17.0. Now, this beta includes the latest open SSL and various security library updates, as well as many more things. The OpenSUSE project is actively seeking testers to help identify and squash bugs before the official release. So if you're up for the challenge, you can download the Leap 15.6 beta and report any issues that you might encounter. If you'd like to learn more, you'll find links in the show notes. Red Hat has announced something very exciting called the Nova project. Nova is a Rust-based GSP-only driver for NVIDIA GPUs, and in the long term, it is intended to serve as the successor to the Nuvo drivers for GSP firmware-based GPUs. While it's still early days, Nova promises a smoother ride for NVIDIA users on newer GPUs. It's designed for Turing and newer GPUs, and Nova promises better performance, and it does so by being written in Rust, because Nova boasts improved memory, safety, and easier maintenance thanks to the Rust programming language. And focusing on newer GPUs with GSP allows for easier driver development, and that's why they're focusing on using the GSP only and that kind of thing for this. And that the lack of upstream Rust abstraction creates challenges, though, but they are having they are have development that's underway for that as well. Danilo Krumrich of Red Hat, sorry if I pr pronounced that wrong, says, With Nova, we see the chance to significantly decrease complexity of the driver compared to Nuvo for mainly two reasons. First, Nuvo's historic architecture, especially around NVIF or, NK, or NVKM, is rather complicated and inflexible and requires major rework to solve certain problems, such as 
uh, locking hierarchy in VMM and MMU code for VM bind currently being solved with a workaround. And second, with a GSP only driver, there is no need to maintain compatibility with pre GSP code. Besides that, we also want to take the chance to contribute to the Rust efforts in the kernel and benefit from more memory safety offered by the Rust programming language. Ideally, all of that leads to better maintainability and a driver that makes it easier for people to get involved into this project. So this means, uh, in the end quote, this means that Nuvo will stick around for old GPUs, but Nova is where they're looking for for the future of NVIDIA support on Linux. If you'd like to learn more about this new project from Red Hat, you'll find links in the show notes. I want you to imagine something. Think of like you've spent hours crafting the perfect desktop environment in KDE Plasma. The colors are just right, the widgets are neatly organized, and everything feels great. And to do this, you installed a global theme. And then you realize that the global theme you just installed deleted all of your data. Well, that doesn't seem like it should be possible to happen, but a user on Reddit experienced exactly this caused by a global theme in the KDE store, which has now caused KDE to issue a warning to users. Global themes are very cool in that they let you personalize the look and feel of your Plasma desktop and share those customizations if you want to. But these themes can apparently run code. While this might even be needed for some of the customization options, it also opens a potential security hole. In this case, a bug in a third-party theme triggered the well-known and dangerous Linux command rm rf with devastating consequences, as you would imagine. For those unfamiliar, rm rf is a powerful command that recursively and permanently deletes files and folders without asking for confirmation. I'm saying this with a little bit of a smirk because there's good news about this. We'll get to that in a minute, the, at least for the individual user who, had, who ran into this. The KDE team, upon discovering this issue, sprang into action. They took down the affected theme and issued warnings, urging users to exercise caution with third-party themes, of course, and additionally, they called on the community to be vigilant and report any suspicious themes through the KDE store. And measures are also underway to implement stricter auditing and warnings before users download themes, which is really good because the KDE team reacted quickly, and they're also putting things into process to try to make this better and make it be sure people are aware that something could be ran and it's not just you know a wallpaper and that sort of stuff so while this in, this incident highlights a potential risk it shouldn't deter you from customizing your desktop and here are some tips to keep you safe if you want uh, be sure to read and rev read reviews and ratings and that sort of stuff and also be sure to back up regularly this might seem obvious but it's very important and in this specific case the data loss appears to be unintentional it was a simple coding error however it serves as a reminder to everyone to always make backups and thankfully the person who found this issue did have backups so nothing was actually lost but you never know what could go wrong even when you're just installing a theme it could delete your data apparently <laughs> so this does not deter me from using KDE plasma of course but um Plasma, for those who don't know, Plasma is my preferred desktop environment. And in fact, I'm currently using KDE Plasma 6 on Fedora 40 beta as I record this. But this will make me more careful with what I use from the KDE store. And now that, I'm, now that I'm talking about this, they should really rename that, by the way, because it's not a store where you buy things. So instead, how about KDE's user repository barn, aka the curb? It's on the curb. If you'd like to learn more about this news, you'll find links in the show notes. Inkscape is getting a major upgrade under the hood, and I'm very excited about this because they are switching to GTK4, which is also paving the way for GPU acceleration in this awesome open source virtual, uh, vector graphics tool. While the next stable release will still use the older toolkit, you can tinker with the cutting edge version now and help iron out any wrinkles. So grab your drawing tablet and get ready to experience Inkscape on a whole new level with GTK4 support. Now, again, like I said, this is not quite ready yet. The next release of 1.4 will still use GTK3 due to some bugs on other operating systems. But this is really awesome because this is a lot of work to change the toolkit. GIMP is still on GTK2 and the next version is going to have GTK3, which is great. But Inkscape is already now going to GTK4. And the way they got it was really cool because they've been getting a lot of funding recently. They said that this is a nine month effort and was funded by generous donations from the community and to the point where they spent 
$80,000 to make this happen. And I want to point this out. This is a huge task to go to a new tool toolkit, especially going to a giant version toolkit switch from GTK3 to GTK4. There are many differences and the amount of work involved in such a robust application to be ported is a lot. So actually $80,000 seems like a really good deal and a lot less than I would have expected. So this is awesome they were able to do it and a fantastic they were able to pay people to make it happen because I love that in the open source world when projects are getting donations and they're being able to fund development for that project, it's awesome. And Inkscape is a really good application. So if you've never heard of it and you want to check, check it out, you'll find links in the show notes. Need to keep your old Ubuntu server running for a critical project but worried about security? Well, Canonical just announced extended support for LTS or long-term support releases, giving you up to 12 years of security updates. This isn't for those who crave the latest features, but for businesses and organizations that prioritize stability over, well, uh, updates. <laughs> so... Breathe a sigh of relief if that's you, the IT admins, because your trusty and maybe a little dusty Ubuntu server can keep chugging along for a whole lot longer. Ubuntu LTS is getting 12 years of security updates. Now, this means that you're going to have five years of the regular maintenance and then the additional 10 years, but then also they have updated another two years for the Ubuntu Pro service. So, you get, if you're paying for the Ubuntu Pro, you can get up to 12 years support. I don't know why you would necessarily want that other than businesses would have servers and don't want to upgrade. I get that sort of part, but you know, that's pretty much all I can imagine anyone would want to keep a system for that long. So if you are still using Ubuntu 14.04 Trusty Tar, then you can wait another couple of years <laughs> if you want to. Also, the extended support helps with critical systems that can easily upgrade because there are many of those. So I guess there is that point too. But anyway... Uh, businesses have until April 2026 to migrate from Ubuntu 14.04 to anything. <laughs> and for those who are using a newer, an, a newer version, like 16.04, you have even longer. So if you'd like to learn more about this, link's in the show notes. Calling all network ninjas, the latest update to Samba is here, bringing a bounty of new features and bug fixes. Samba 4.20 lets you search for files on Windows servers like a Pro, monitor connections more effectively, and even streamline configurations. Uh, get ready to boost your file and print sharing between Linux and Windows machines because there's a new tool that lets you search for files on Windows computers directly. Very nice. Very nice to see that. Also, they have improved cluster support, so Samba can now better handle connections to Windows server clusters and so much more. If you'd like to learn more about Samba 4.20, you'll find links in the show notes. Thanks for watching this episode of This Week in Linux. If you like what I do here on this show and want to be kept up to date with what's going on in Linux and open source world, then be sure to subscribe. And of course, remember to like that smash button. If you'd like to support the show and the Tux Digital Network, then consider becoming a patron by going to tuxdigital.com slash membership, where you can get a bunch of cool perks like access to patron-only sections of our Discord server and much, much more. You can also support the show by ordering the Linux is Everywhere t-shirt or the This Week in Linux shirt at tuxdigital.com slash store. Plus, while you're there, check out all the other great stuff we have like hats, mugs, hoodies, stickers, and so much more at tuxdigital.com slash store. I'll see you next time for another episode of Your Source for Linux GNU's. Thanks again for watching. I'm Michael Tunnell. I hope you're doing swell. Be sure to ring that notification bell. And until next time, I bid you farewell.